When the debt crisis hit Ireland, the Troika and the creditor countries demanded from the Irish government to, do, to take deep cuts in, in right. government expenditure. Uh, for example, in unemployment benefits and other social mm -hmm. benefits and so on. So many people in Ireland sacrificed mm -hmm. a lot for this adjustment. Mm. Would have been there an alternative to raise taxes from transnational corporations who use Ireland as a tax haven? Certainly, that would have been an alternative. But taxes could have been raised not just on the transnationals, but also on the very wealthy. Uh, and that, that, there, is, there is a problem generally with taxing the very wealthy and taxing the transnationals. And I think both of those could have been tackled to a greater extent. How is it possible that on the one hand, Ireland has to borrow 64 billion euros mm. from the other euro countries and the IMF? And on the other hand, Ireland still stays a tax haven for transnational corporations by which all the other countries lose a lot of tax revenue. Right. It's, it's a puzzle because there is a very deep, deep belief in Ireland amongst a large section of the establishment and indeed the academic community mm -hmm. that the tax reliefs that we offer to multinational companies are in the interest of Ireland. That if they didn't get these reliefs, they would leave. Now at the same time these people would argue that they're here for a lot of reasons other than tax relief but there is a general fear that if Ireland did not offer these reliefs that the foreign investment would move elsewhere and the jobs would move elsewhere. Well but it's to have a low tax rate for corporate profits mm. to compensate for the periphery situation and transport costs makes sense but there are a lot of legal constructions which allow corporations to transfer profits from yes. all over the world to Ireland and by this they don't pay any tax. Right. So how does this help the, the industry in, in, in Ireland? I do not understand. Well, one of the problems is that we've offered tax reliefs to foreign investment since 1958 for over 50 years. So if tax reliefs worked, we should be the richest country in the world, if not in Europe. Yeah. The problem is that tax reliefs have very unintended consequences. The kind of companies that we attract to Ireland tend to be those companies for which tax relief is important. If tax relief is important, then you're a mobile company. If wages rise in Ireland compared with other countries, then they move. They will, be, they, will they will move their location in response to the changes in the tax regime, of which Ireland may have no control whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So it's a very risky form of industrial strategy. Mm -hmm. Do you have an informed estimate what volumes of money is involved in this tax hiding, tax evasion business in Ireland? It's very difficult to know because a lot of subsidiaries of multinational companies do not produce accounts. Mm -hmm. So it's really only because of the investigations by the US Senate subcommittee that we know about the profits of Apple and it's because of an investigation by the House of Commons we know about the, the profits of Google. But it's likely that they're very large indeed. From my own research, I've identified companies that benefit from what's called the double Irish, including Apple, that they make profits which are not subject to tax of about 31.8 billion. That's for 2011. But it's likely to be much larger than that because that's only a small fraction of the companies that may potentially be benefiting from the double Irish and other tax reliefs. Mm -hmm. So imagine for a moment, yeah. let's say the 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 usual tax rate in, yes. in Ireland for corporate profits is 12.5%. Right. If they would have only paid this 12.5% 12, 12 right. to the Irish uh, yes. uh, state coffers, uh, how much difference would ha that have made for the austerity program? It would have made a dramatic difference. But the problem is that people who would oppose that strategy would say, well, if you try to tax these profits, these companies will move. So you will lose the benefits of the employment here. If they employ anybody, you'd lose the employer's PRSI and you'd lose various other economic advantages to having these companies here. It's very difficult to know how companies will react to these tax changes. And if these tax changes come about because of the OECD BEPS programme, then there is a danger that some of these companies will move. Well, now, it's very difficult to know how, how much of them will move or what to extend it. I think it underlines that, look, our industrial policy based on attracting companies via tax havens, by, by becoming a tax haven, is very risky. I think the industrial policy should emphasize indigenous firms that are embedded in the local economy have high linkages. 
These are the firms that are less likely to move because of a shift in yeah. the tax position. They're likely to be here for the longer term. Some of these companies will come and they'll go, and it's very expensive getting them here because of the, not only is the tax relief, but sometimes they get capital grants and whatever, and other countries lose out a lot of tax revenue. Mm -hmm. If you like, Ireland is getting an advantage, uh, not because we're giving up tax ourselves, but because other countries are losing a lot of tax and in particular countries where uh, these companies operate in Germany and France and whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And wouldn't it have been sensible for the Troika delegations to raise this issue and discuss it with the corporations? Of course they would have been sensible, or if they discussed it with the, the, the relevant government authorities. But it, it is interesting that that issue, as far as I know, was not raised. Or certainly, it, uh, there's no public comment about Ireland's corporate tax rate as being raised, because the government has been adamant that the 12.5% rate would not change. But now, there's been no discussion about changing the 12.5% rate, because the key thing is the tax regime. Yeah. The 12.5%, because many of these companies that benefit from the double Irish, the tax rate is not 125 it's actually zero. Yeah. And that issue was not raised. Perhaps it's because the Troika weren't sufficiently informed or it, it's very difficult to know what, what, what the answer to your question is, yes. Sorry, I, I can't agree with this not informed. It's impossible. You know, the issue is yes. in discussion in Brussels since decades. Yes. So I'm 100% sure that officials from the EU Commission know all the details about the tax regime in, in Ireland. Uh, so one phone call of the Troika delegation's members in Brussels would have been enough to get information about this. I think they knew about the tax regime, but they didn't know about the size of it. It's only when the Apple report from the permanent subcommittee and of the US Senate came out that realized that this one subsidiary was making 22 billion US dollars in, in profits and paying 10 million in tax. Now that tax may or not be paid in Ireland or whatever. So I think it's actually very difficult to get to know about what's the size of it. All you could say is that it's substantial. And for some US multinational companies, it's uh, the Irish tax regime is a major factor in why they don't pay tax at 35% in the US. And there are several companies identify this mm -hmm. uh, as being a, a, an important factor. They have uh, companies like Google and Apple would say they have two tax jurisdictions. Or in fact, in Google alone, Apple just claims not to have any other tax ju jurisdiction apart from the US. That there are two main tax jurisdictions, the US and Ireland. So I think it might be the case that they didn't actually know that the actual size of the profits that were actually been subject to zero tax, not, not 12 and a half, but actually zero. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I do ask because on the one hand, the Troika mm -hmm. intervened yes. heavily in domestic policies yes. in, in all the crisis countries. Right. For example, they demanded radical reforms of the right. labor market or mm -hmm. uh, of the public uh, uh, officials' uh, payments or of the general system of public mm -hmm. services. Right. So they intervene deeply in, in domestic issues. And on the other hand, when it comes to the wealthy or to transnational corporations, there is a there is yeah. a hesitation to even right. touch the yes. issue. Yes. Isn't yeah. isn't it completely biased the whole approach? It is. And it's not just we have another issue in relation to what are we call non doms. That is, sorry, there there are people who who are, who are, who are not resident in Ireland. Yeah. So they're they're Irish people, but they've moved their residence to the to the elsewhere. Uh, these used to be around three thousand. Now there's only over ten thousand of them. It's a real issue. Some of these people have property in Ireland and very little effort it seems to me to be made to actually tax these people. So it's the problem of taxing mobile capital and mobile wealthy individuals. Mm -hmm. It's a huge issue uh, and, and it's something that should have been addressed and it can only be really addressed, I think, at an EU level. I don't think it can really be addressed by an individual country alone. But I think but the that Troika would, yeah. is an EU issue. It should, it should, exactly, exactly. That's what's what so it was on the EU level should, already. Yeah, EU level. And why they didn't uh, do something about uh, this taxation issue is a puzzle, yes. Do you know if there are also French and German corporations involved in this? It's very interesting because there is uh, there was some report that a German company called SAP SAP was on this sort of issue but is no longer involved and also a French company. I, the impression I would have, although I'm not an expert, is that uh, German companies are more likely to use a similar type of tax, uh, low tax centres within the Netherlands and then Luxembourg and even Belgium, I've read about some German companies using that, and French companies may use other tax regimes. The problem is that there are multiple low tax uh, regimes where 
uh, companies can minimise their tax. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I haven't come across it. One, it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. So Ireland, it's really, it's really US companies that are really benefit the most, I would say, from the Irish tax regime. Mm -hmm. Which ones? Uh, US companies, in particular, I think um, Apple, Google, Microsoft, uh, but like, but there are lots of lots of Facebook, LinkedIn, PayPal. They all have the similar type of structure, in which they have the double Irish, in which they're incorporated in Ireland, but they're regarded as being resident for corporate tax purposes in Bermuda, the Cayman Islands, or whatever. And by the way, that this isn't an Irish law. This this arose because a ruling by the Revenue Commissioners. Mm -hmm. They just said well, like, we will allow you to be incorporated here, but not taxed here subject to corporation tax. They pay other taxes if they're liable, but corporation taxes say nothing to do with us here. So they have a deal with the with the Irish finance authorities? There are favourable rulings. Now, uh, the Irish uh, tax authority would say this is not uh, uh, it is not agreed on an individual company basis that no company mm -hmm. got this favourable ruling. But nevertheless, uh, the Irish tax authorities also say in, in answer to a parliamentary question at all, that they look very carefully at each case. So each case must be to some extent unique. So you, to some extent you could say, yeah, yeah, they have reached an agreement with this company that under these circumstances, they will be regarded as being not subject to corporation tax mm -hmm. in Ireland. Mm -hmm. When our finance minister, Mr. Wolfgang Schäuble, was asked why on the one hand they have imposed all these conditions mm -hmm. on Ireland and on the other hand did not touch the tax regime, he said, well, in tax issues, the European Union has no comp competence. So it's not allowed on the European level to intervene in tax issues. Uh, I, think, I think that might be true in relation to the tax rate. Yeah. But it's, it, the tax rate is not an issue here. It's the tax regime that is the, it's its issue. And to some extent, he may be the, it may be true. It may be the case that you need a bilateral intervention. And there has been bilateral intervention by various uh, governments through their court system. Mm -hmm. For example, Spain took a court case against a subsidiary of Dale Ireland, which they won in relation to whether it had a taxable presence in Spain, and they won that case. And in fact, there is research indicating that a lot of companies are in dispute with the tax authorities as to where they are located and where the profits are being declared. Mm -hmm. This is particularly the case in the digital economy, but it's not. But it, because uh, most most companies have some sort of digital presence, it also applies to companies such as Ryanair and other companies as well. Mm -hmm. Well, the interesting thing is, as far as the competence of the European institutions oh, are yeah. concerned, they have no competence to intervene in. Uh, wage finding and uh, collective bargaining and uh, all this all, all what what has to do how employers and employees yeah. negotiate about yeah. their about wages yeah. but they did intervene in this without yes. having competence yes. Yes. so there's a certain level of hypocrisy also in this debate yeah? well i think that's how they interpret competition so they they have uh, they have in their remit uh, the ability to make rulings about what will affect competition and uh, the ability of states to balance their budget and whatever. But it is interesting that th this, comp this, this, um, this uh, policy of intervention seems to only apply in certain areas, but not in others. Other areas that say, no, we, we're not interested in that. We can't deal with that. We don't have the competency to deal with that. It is a puzzle, yeah. OK, thank you very much. I think that was it. One last question from your perspective. If some would ask you if the the Troika that officially has left the country, was it a success story or not? What would you say? Yeah, right. Um, I think some of the things that the Troika introduced were good. There's no doubt about that. But some of the things were enormously damaging to the Irish economy. And it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't just an ECB policy as well. At some stage, it did enormous damage to the Irish economy. What, for uh, example? Well, for example, one of the, uh, one of the, the, the things that they, they said is that um, they, they, they said, if we, unless we go into a bailout program, they will remove emergency lending uh, to the Irish banks. Uh, and so there was some threat over that. The same thing happened in relation to Cyprus. I think this is strictly illegal because they are a central bank and they're supposed to apply emergency lending. So that was an issue. When we went into the bailout program, the rates charged on the loans were at penal rates. And that, so, so we're, we're suffering from huge 
loss in revenue, uh, the, there's a huge crisis, and yet we're being the loans we got were, 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 were above market rates of interest. Now, they were substantially reduced, but that was certainly not helpful to Ireland. In addition to competition policy, competition policy insisted that the banks sell off all their subsidiaries. So the banks, the Irish banks, had to sell off their subsidiaries at the bottom price. Mm -hmm. If they had been allowed to hold onto their subsidiaries, they might have been able to get a better price uh, in the long run. There were, there were also other, other interests which were not in the Irish interest. And I think that the Irish state did resist, to some extent, some of the demands of the Troika, for example, in relation to cutting um, the minimum wage and in relation to certain social security expenditures but other things i think they did not they did not resist for example the privatization of the water uh, of water authority that was something that should have been resisted but it was not resisted uh, they did manage to resist other forced privatizations which again would have been a disaster mm -hmm. like it happened in other countries like it happened in other countries yeah yeah, yeah. Will yeah. be a major issue in the film as well. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah. particular, Greece. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, yeah. I mean, they're giving away anything. I yeah? mean, what they did when Cyprus was appalling. They, 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 it wasn't. They, it was just one bank was at risk, but they said to the entire banking system, "We will emer we remove emergency lending to the entire banking system." That is strictly illegal. And do you know one thing? I think overnight. Yeah. They robbed 3.4 billion euros totally. from the Cypriot banking system just to support one Greek bank. I know. And save them from yeah. from insolvency. Yeah, uh, yeah. This is completely illegal. I mean, there is another issue because the ECB was intervening and buying government bonds, and it intervened when government bonds were at rock bottom. They're now sitting on a huge capital gain. Yeah. They're a major share, a major owner of Irish government debt. So. The issue is, what will they do with this capital gain? They have made huge profit out of the Irish crisis, as they've done with the Spain crisis, Spanish crisis, the Greek crisis, because government debt has gone up so much in value. So the issue is, is, is this, what is the ECB going to do with this surplus and on their balance sheet? Uh, should they return it to the countries where they made the gain? Should there be some sort of sharing? What, what's going to happen to this capital gain that they made, which is many billions? They could take it as compensation for the losses they are going to make. If, if the debt is right, okay, if they write off the Greek debt. Yeah, but they are, I think, did they agree to write and take a loss on the Greek debt? Uh, I'm not sure that they agreed that, did they? No, up until now, not. Uh, not uh, but they will but, make, okay, they, your prediction, yes. Yeah. Sooner or later it will happen. <laughs> yes, you know, yeah, Greek debt is now at 170% of I, I know, GDP yeah. debt ratio, so yeah, it, it's, yeah. there's no way out. Yeah. They, can, yeah. they never can pay back. Well, Last question, do you think that the Irish debt is sustainable? It's above 120% to GDP now? It's, it's very difficult to know that because while the Troika again focused on the debt, yeah. the Irish state has huge assets. You may have a chance to visit our National Gallery. Our National Gallery has paintings which are probably worth in, the, yeah. in excess of a billion. There are lots of other state assets. So it's only one side of the balance sheet that's, that's always looked at. Uh, and I think that's a, again, a mistake as well. I think borrowing to finance infrastructural investment is a good thing. That's the way out of this crisis. The constant focus on the debt GDP ratio, I think, is totally, it's totally misjudged. And it's something that uh, I think has been a major problem in the Troika policies, because mm -hmm. what they should have been looking at is that the assets that states have, they should have been looking at the return available from state borrowing and what would be the overall effects on the economy. Mm -hmm. What do you think why they did not? It's, it's just, it's just such narrow-minded neoclassical economics. You know, Reinhardt and this other book mm -hmm. saying there's a, there's a ratio of debt to GDP. Once you get beyond that ratio, you're in economic crisis. It's complete nonsense. But all these guys are trained economists having worked in their jobs for decades and... Uh... Look, if the crisis shows one thing, it's that macroeconomics is intellectually bankrupt. Not all of it, but a lot of macroeconomics is intellectually bankrupt. And have these people no shame, I can't understand how they're still talking the same old uh, rubbish and the same without any empirical evidence or whatever. I think it's a huge puzzle for me. Yeah. Yeah. And they defend it. Yeah, they still defend def it on camera. For example, yeah. we did an interview with Harald yeah. Wieser. You know Harald yeah. Wieser? Yeah. Head of the working group of the right. Eurogroup. Yeah. Yeah? So he's, he's the czar there yeah, yeah. of the whole process. Right. He defended nearly everything. Every nonsense he defended. Yeah. Yeah? Even, even the sale of 
of a huge part of Athens yeah, for a third of its mm. uh, estimated mm. value to mm. one mm. mafiotic uh, Greek oligarch. Yeah? Because even if you're looking at a formation of a company or a household, a company may have, a, or a household may have a lot of debt, but if yeah. they have the assets, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But when this comes to the state, we don't look at the assets, we only look at the debt. Mm -hmm. And we don't look at the return that potentially borrowing might, might create. I think it's a huge problem with the mindset of thinking at the EU level, at the Euro level. It's been captured by this very narrow mindset about how economies work and what's in the best interest of economies. Mm -hmm. But how, how it come that these people are in power? I have really difficulties, you know, I'm always asked, they are only officials, they, they, it's, it's mm -hmm. not their personal gain, yeah? yeah. You know, if, 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 a, if, a, if a corporate uh, manager yeah. uses these primitive arguments, it's understandable because it's in his or her favor. Yes. But why they? Why, yes. why officials who have no personal interest in this game? It is, it is extraordinary. I mean, how a very narrow uh, ideology yeah. managed to get control of institutions that are so important have had such a, a huge effect yeah. on the lives of, of millions of people in, in the Euro area and the Eurozone. Yeah. It is an extraordinary thing. And have you ever read or heard a, a good explanation how it happened? Ideological bias is so difficult to explain. I mean, there, there are, again... No, but like how it happened, they, they, they took over the whole commission. I think it's because it was the dominant thinking at the time they were getting their jobs. So that very neoclassical, yeah. neoliberal dom was the dominant thinking, that government debt is bad, that uh, uh, a large state sector is really bad, mm -hmm. the smaller the state sector the better, that uh, private sector decisions are always good, public sector decisions are always bad. That was the dominant sort of ideology when these people got into power and got their jobs and they're still there. Ago, 20 years ago. 20 years ago and they're still there. They have learned nothing. Don't broadcast that. <laughs> <laughs>